Ben's thing. We'll add Jay's thing. All right, I will hand it off to you and Jay. Thanks so much. Whoop. <laughs> Hi, Jay. Uh, hello, I am fixing my exposure, hello. which is apparently ridiculous. <laughs> okay, that's a lot better. <laughs> you look normal now. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and everyone up here with me for just another second. So I'm doing something uh, extra complicated here. Um, and uh, actually, I think somebody actually has now. Kendall Hilner has joined on the uh, the Zoom uh, as well as... Uh, as well as some friends of mine as well um, uh, from outside, just in order to provide some aspect of audience, uh, partic like not participation, but some level of audience feedback back to me. Uh, this is something where I, uh, I, I was honestly extremely concerned about the idea of giving a talk where I was going to be just staring at a computer screen for some long period of time. And the... Uh, I'm oh, sorry, and, and now this is actually causing interesting issues. So I was like, okay, well, there's a per per person who actually had an echo now giving me, giving me my own voice, and so I actually had to mute that. So sorry, Kendall. Um, but so uh, you can't actually, who can't hear me? Whoever just said that, say that again. And now, okay, uh, I'm now looking to see if John can hear me. Uh, actually, I don't even know how to do that anymore. I've lost it. Here we go. Don't, okay. Not seeing anything there. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. Somebody said something and then suddenly, there we go. Thank you, Max. You figured it out. Okay. It was that I was muted on the Zoom. Okay, great. All right. So essentially, I, I give a lot of talks, but I I've I never record talks, and part of the re and I certainly never pre-record talks. And part of the way I say I never record talks, like I never like personally like really just sit down and like for the purpose of recording a talk. I always have to give one to a live audience. I've I have had a very difficult time trying to figure out how I was going to give a talk where I was not going to be like able to stare at anybody. And so that's that's why I've now had um, this process. And I've got um, Andrea, Matt Whitlock, Le Levy. Thank you so much for for being willing to let you know be my little guinea pig here in order to let you. Let you let me see you during this talk. All right. So then uh, I spent a uh, probably too long figuring out how I was going to then do the process of, of the live version of this talk. And so I um, I, I often do do slides, um, uh, various forms. And so one of the ways of doing that um, is, uh, you know, I could just have the slide and then kind of embed myself. And actually the way that I just did that there caused my exposure configuration to get lost. Uh, there we go. Um, but one of the one of the things about this is is that okay so now my head is extremely small um, one one of the uh, uh, and this is actually somewhat somewhat similar to what the, the Streamyard setup um, I considered going to um, something like this because um, a lot of my slides are in four three always I. Uh, I, 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 by having them in 4.3, it actually allows me to have do this sort of setup that I've done before. Um, uh, John noted the case that this actually gives me a lot more room for my slides, but that actually had an interesting question, which was that, um, what really are my slides? Uh, and so I, after the course of spending time thinking through, well, maybe I should just give a talk, maybe I should um, go and try to do this kind of setup, I started working out towards essentially trying to do like a last week tonight style version of the, the presentation where I used mostly stock um, uh, stock photos that I managed to pull off of, off of various um, like, like Adobe stock site, which apparently are all in 3.2. Uh, so I've, I've spent a lot of time working on the technical details of this talk, and we will hope that there's actually some content to back up the fact that I bothered to do all of this. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry, I just really had to say all of that, and I also, the other caveat is that I, is, as is usual, I got an hour and a half of sleep. So let's go into this. So my name is Jay Freeman, and my talk today is Working From Hell. Uh, the con, the, the idea of doing this kind of talk um, is something, the idea of doing this talk is another thing where usually I come to a conference and I try to figure out after talking to everybody what it is that they're dealing with and what it is that they're most interested in hearing about. And that was also something that was somewhat difficult here and is partly difficult because we're all working from home. And um, a, a, an aspect of that um, is, is, which is something that I've done my entire life um, and is something that interestingly is a note, is it like a, a, a um, something that I've noted at the beginning of many of the talks that I've given um, is this idea that I kind of work from anywhere. And so 
there's this photo that I've used in a lot of presentations uh, of uh, where I'm working uh, somewhere at a club somewhere in Vegas. I actually do remember this was um, uh, GeoHot had just won a Pwn to Own award. Um, that, sorry, that had just won a Pony award. Uh, and um, uh, everyone is going out, um, jumping around between different clubs. And uh, I, I'm not really a person who does this sort of thing. And so I'm sitting around um, working on my laptop the entire time while there's this giant event occurring behind me. And so in some sense, I, I, I kind of describe this then as working from hell. Um, uh, the process of the way that I tend to tend to have set up my life to work on things just allows me to kind of work from anywhere. Um, actually, I've got presenter notes, which I should be using here so that I can see what's going on next. And but but in some sense, though, the answer to the question of like, well, how do you do this sort of thing is relatively easy. The answer to the to this sort of thing is is earplugs. I, I use I use earplugs and that allows me to work in all sorts of weird, crazy environments. But of course, there's there's more to that. Um, and the process of trying to describe why I end up feeling comfortable doing this and how it comes to this, uh, that ends up leading to a talk which may or may not be best described by working from hell. Uh, but that is also the story of many of my talks. So another thing that I'm doing, I can tell by the way, I'm just really sorry, is that I'm, I'm talking even faster than Jane normally talks in an attempt to try to deal with the, um, the, 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 the relative level of nervousness. But, uh, Actually, the audience is actually working for me. Actually, I'm seeing people reacting to these kinds of comments. It's great. So, um, one of the one of the things to, that that is just a property of me as I as I kind of run about and do do various things is that uh, honestly, I I do show up late to a lot of things. Where I show up just barely on time. Uh, it is is something that um, many cases uh, is a is a is a horrible failing. Um, but also, it's something that uh, I, is maybe just part and parcel of dealing dealing with me. Um, this is something that not everyone enjoys at all. Uh, so not not everybody enjoys certainly some people who just like absolutely hate it. Um, there's actually there was this interesting article um, that I saw. Um, it was like seven years ago now, and uh, somebody had posted, which was, um, "You're not running late. You are just rude and self-centered, and um, uh, or something else like that." It was, and it was interesting reading it because it was it was some somebody who was just extremely angry about the idea that somebody would not sh not like prioritize always showing up on time to absolutely everything that they do. Now of course like you know if that's something like a talk. You know I'm gonna. You know, show up on time for the talk. I mean, I've 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 skirted it. I mean, I showed up like three seconds on time once for a um, uh, for for a, a um, 360 uh, uh, intersect talk. But I've I, I I show up I show up before the talk starts at least at least three seconds before the show, before the talk starts. Um, but the level of anger and vitriol that that was that was expressed inside of this this article was interesting um and essentially it comes down to this notion that you know essentially you're being extremely rude um when you are when, when you don't show up on time for something you're supposed to show up on time for so to put this in some interesting context i think so thanksgiving dinner is the kind of extremely formal event that my even my mentality is like okay well clearly you show up on time for thanksgiving dinner you know everyone is every this is like a time you were you were given a time that things are happening everyone's going to show up um you know you're going to sit down everyone's got this organized process where the meal comes out there was a thanksgiving where i was invited to a friend of mine's house in order to um uh, do thanksgiving dinner and i was actually in charge of constructing part of the dinner at my house and bringing it and all sorts of things started going wrong. I, I was having issues where my oven wasn't working correctly, and I was having issues, and 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 uh, I was just frantically panicking as I was like trying to trying to get all this put together and manage to put everything together. I I I I. I I got there. I was I was like five or ten minutes late. I was just so apologetic. I show up, and I'm actually the only person who showed up, other than the host, who has pretty much just started cooking. He's like, "Yeah, come on in. This is gonna be fun." And I'm really confused for a second because uh, this is at least the kind of experience that even Jay thinks, "Okay, well, everyone shows up on time for Thanksgiving dinner." But no, not the person the mentality of this person. Th this person, that's not that would never even occur to them. In fact, they were not expecting anyone to show up for at least a couple hours. And so I was then end up sitting around with the host for a very long period of time as we as we like, continued finishing the main part of the meal he was cooking. Somebody showed up an hour later as like the other first guest who was kind of showing up. Dinner ended up happening quite a bit later. Things started. Because in some extent, the goal was to just have people kind of show up and spend time doing dinner together. And, and, and if somebody showed up later, will there be food for them? It wasn't a big deal. And that was how the host had thought about the process. And honestly, that was how I usually think about that sort of process. But that was not how I thought about it for Thanksgiving dinner. And so when I think about these ideas then of like where rudeness comes from, I start to ask the question about like whether 
would the person that you think is being rude to you think that you were being rude to them if you treated them the same way that they're treating you? Which is an interesting thought process because it turns into turns into the broken version of that rule you sometimes hear, right? You know, it's like you know the the the, the reason why the golden rule. The golden rule exists in some sense is to attempt to get people to to not do treat others the way that they treat you you know so the golden rule is instead do unto others as um uh you would have them do unto you um and uh and and whereas if you do that in some cases actually you might realize that you're being rude to them and you've been put in an awkward situation where you are now being confusing uh, and and potentially harming yourself by putting going out of your way to do something that somebody else wasn't necessarily expecting. So there's then wrong direction. There's then this idea of the platinum rule, which is um, do unto others as they would have you do unto them, uh, which thankfully kind of solves a lot of the problems of retaliation that the kind of maybe the silver rule sort of has, or you know maybe just the oaken rule sort of has, um, while also kind of fixing the issue with the golden rule. But I think. It, it's interesting because this this does have the property that if 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 you know that somebody is the kind of person who when they say you know show up at a particular time is actually probably not even slightly ready for you to show up at that particular time because that's not really how they think about it but they'd be happy if you I mean they they wouldn't be like unhappy if you show up. They, they'd be ah it's cool you can show up but like you don't it's not like if you show up and are apologetic well that almost puts them out in the sense of like well I didn't mean for you to have to rush this hard in order to attend to you all right so. Back in 2007, there was this relatively popular Metafilter um, post that went around. Apparently, I ended up... I, I actually um, uh, only really heard about the Metafilter post on this recently, but it was called Ask Versus Guest Culture. And honestly, there was a talk by Catherine Wu from Heroku that just went through this in way more detail than I thought was remotely um, possible for me. I mean, this was an extremely good talk, and you can find at least the slides online. The slides are actually the kind of slides you can follow. But the, the general premise of Ask Versus Guest Culture... Um, is that some people have this property that they expect you to be constantly um, uh, figuring out what they might want uh, and then trying to help with it. And that, that they also do that to you, right? And so it's like, and, and, and um, where if somebody asks you for something, well, then they probably really need it because they wouldn't really be asking for it unless they thought that you thought, unless they thought that you would be in a position to do it and then maybe that you would in your position do it for them. And so they kind of had to go really far out of their way to do it. Um, and so maybe it would be a really big problem if you were to say no. Whereas kind of in an ask culture, you just ask for things constantly. And then somebody, um, uh, and if somebody doesn't want to do it, they just say no. And it's okay. You know, you, no harm, no foul. I asked. You said no. No big deal with this. Um, now, this ask versus guest culture um, is something that you actually, it doesn't just, it's not just like, you know, organized by fam family boundaries or anything. You actually see this kind of um, uh, different uh, areas of the world kind of have self-organized around various different aspects of this. And so this is actually a photo that somebody took of Catherine Wu's presentation um, for having been sufficiently, like, it was just such a, such a great slide that it's not even just like, you know, I'm pulling from the slide. I'm pulling somebody who pulled the slide and posted it somewhere in order to post it. Um, going through different, you know, a handful of different countries and kind of laying them out on this kind of axis. All right. Now, I've seen that example come up in various points, but I haven't seen, there, there are a lot of other particularly interesting examples. Now, this, this is one that you will hear about. Um, so um, in Persian culture, there's this idea of, of tarof, uh, where, and I'm probably not pronouncing it even slightly correctly, um, which is that uh, if somebody, is, um, in order to show respect for somebody, you offer them things, maybe things that you would never actually give them. Um, just it, it's, it's, that's the correct thing that you should do is, is that, um, uh, you should offer that they should be able to, you know, how about you just come move in with me? Um, knowing full well that that would horrify you if they actually said yes, but you just need to be able to offer that. And then the other person is just of course going to say no, but now they feel respected for the fact that you have offered that. And maybe if you offer it again a couple times that then that actually kind of indicates that that is something, um, that, uh, they will, um, uh, that that was actually being offered um, uh, maybe for real in some sense. And something you can find, there's Wikipedia articles about it. And the reason it's interesting to, to look at this particular um, Persian tradition because it is so well defined and you find so many like blog posts and articles about people who are either within that culture and, and then having the realization as they leave it or people who are outside of it. And it even has like a name within the culture um, that, they, that they've assigned to it. It's, 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 it's a nice example because it doesn't involve being like, oh, you know, I, I heard that this group of people has this particular, you know, belief structure it's like they've actually given it a name and they talk about it as um 
So when I was in college, I took a large number of linguistics courses. Um, which actually caused the computer science department um, where I was at some some strife. They started to wonder, you know, are you even taking computer science? What are you doing here? You know, why? it seems like you're just spending, spending a lot of time taking linguistics courses. Um, one of the courses that I took was on what is known as discourse. So discourse is the study of larger scale communication. Um, it's not like you know phonetics, the study of sound, or it's more um, uh, phonology, the study of like how sounds bleed together, or morphology, the study of how you might take multiple sounds or or um, uh, or multiple written, written units and put them together in order to construct words. Um, and you start building up your intonation units. Discourse is like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm going to spend this 40 minutes of, of time trying to communicate an idea with you using strings of sentences. And, and, and how do I end up doing that? Um, and particularly in the course of, of you know, dialogues between multiple parties. Um, and um, one of the big aspects of that is something where you do this thing called turn taking. Um, where when I'm done speaking, um, of course, it's not, not in a broadcast um, style talk environment like this, but when I'm done speaking, um, it would then become somebody else's turn to begin speaking. When does that happen, and how do we actually figure out when that should occur? And it seems like it should be easy. It should be when somebody's done speaking, then the next person gets to start speaking. And so um, you can kind of like very... Um, almost mathematically just kind of decide that like, okay, well, you know, it's like, that's, that's how the turn taking works. But well, what does it really mean for somebody to be done speaking? So if I, for example, take a, take a long pause, but it's clear that I'm kind of halfway through a sentence, does that mean that it is now time for you to join in? Um, if I finish a sentence, but I haven't necessarily finished a thought, um, if I just take a pause, um, maybe I'm collecting my thoughts. And so different people have different ways of thinking about this. But what's, what I think particularly almost like it's so weird to understand as humans that there's this particular thing that almost starts to, starts to become like, where's the magic on all of this? The amount of time it takes you to make sound is ridiculously long. You have to inhale breath and organize like wind going through different like you know, little, little tube area. You have to have constructed the thought and it does take non-negligible time for your brain to coalesce thought into an intonation unit, serialize it into that little packet that it needs to then construct into audio in order to actually say. The, it is almost certainly the case that you were starting that process well before the other person stopped stopped talking and you were preparing aspects of it. Maybe you actually had to do like a fast abort on it. Maybe it was almost like subconscious that the, how um, the abort process even, much less the setup process. And the sort of like human-like predictive setup process is really is something that you see a lot because it's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to make some kind of motion with my hand, but the sheer number of muscles in order to use my hand are so many that like it, it takes time for that to happen. So because of all this kind of prediction that's going on, in practice, there's negative turn-taking latency is not just something that uh, can happen. It's something that you can only expect to happen, that there's going to be cases where um, you do that prediction and everyone just kind of accepts you to that prediction and starts speaking while somebody else is speaking. Now, I am one of the people who do this. And so this is something where I'm, I'm constantly feeling like I'm anticipating what other people are, are reaching. The um, like sentence final intonation is something that we, we tend to talk about. Um, I'm constantly like processing where, what your thought structure is like and trying to come up with like with a moment in which I think like you're like halfway through the sentence that I'm pretty certain is your last sentence. You're about to make a point. Even if you necessarily weren't finishing a point, it'd certainly be a reasonable opportunity for me to break in. And when I'm le letting myself be most comfortable, I do. And... This has this property uh, with, with some people of causing a giant argument almost instantaneously that you have interrupted them and that it is not okay. Whereas I deal with a lot of people, in particular I grew up with a lot of people, and, um, where that was, that was just not, that was just how communication happened. It's just like you, you, you start speaking, somebody else breaks in. This, this aspect, uh, the, the, the feeling sometimes he gets described to the other person is, well, you weren't even listening to me if you were already speaking. But in fact, again, that's kind of like how speech works in some sense, is that I had to be constructing processing what you were saying, figuring out how I was going to respond to it, and then doing the response to you at the time. It's not, I, I actually can speak and be hearing a little bit at the same time. People can actually do simultaneous discussions. It's, it's not that, it's not very common at all. I mean, the, the, the negative turn-taking latency that you get uh, tends to be at most like two seconds, but people actually can overlap quite a bit, and it actually works out fine. Now, the, the, now, 
when you do this, I'm going to then argue, it actually causes fun conversation dynamics, if you're willing to try doing it. Um, uh, and it kind of cranks up the conversation to 11 with like kind of rapid back and forth of being able to just essentially remove random latency that was occurring in the middle. If you're okay with the idea that somebody kept talking and essentially refused your floor transfer and that, that you just stopped talking and it's no harm, no foul, no one really cares all that much, it's great. It, it allows for a... Um, uh, a, 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 then a path towards with the same protocol in some sense being able to slip yourself in the middle of a, of a thought process that somebody's having that you didn't understand the beginning of and then essentially request a floor transfer halfway through begin the process of doing it the other person kind of accepts your then you can kind of and then they can re-interrupt you back as soon as they realize what your thought process is or the fact that they don't need to be dealing with that kind of interruption at that time um, it's, it's something that I think is consistent on one side and I also agree that it's consistent on the other side. I don't. I don't look at the like. I, it, it took me time for what it's worth I mean, uh, to come to like, grips with the idea that the people who were just like you're not listening to me, or at least dealing with other people where that's the case, uh, and that that is like that that's the thought process that like it's a, that it's a consistent thought process. And, and, and so I then spend some, spend some of my time then trying to figure out like you know when I'm in conversations with people. Actually, I, I, there was one that I was supposed to do here. Um, and so, and so I, this is another thing, though, where I feel like it's one of those, um, do, if you do it to the other person, do they consider it bad that you did it to them? And if you, for example, interrupt them, but you don't, you, you, one of the problems I've noticed is, is that the, the, per, the way that the other person then tries to demonstrate that interrupting is, is bad is that they simply say, I'm interrupting you. They don't, like, start a new thought. They don't respond to anything you say. They just, like, doesn't it feel bad when somebody says something in the halfway through your sentence? And it just, it turns into this kind of, like, really broken communication paradigm. And so what it's, what it caused, what's caused is in California, I don't run into that many people who do this. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about the idea that, okay, no, you, you're feeling like you want to jump in, but just don't say anything. Okay, no, 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 you know, you're feeling, don't say anything. You started jumping in, don't just like conscious, abort and apologize. Say it is okay for them to keep talking and then let them keep talking. And I do this constantly and I'm doing this every single time I say anything. And it is actually extremely wearing on the idea that I'm doing this. But this is something that in some sense is a relatively benign thing versus many other cultural differences that come up between parties that then end up leading to scenarios that are just extremely broken. So whereas I can, and it's honestly, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit frustrating. And at times I do worse because I'm more tired, tired, more tired, and it's more difficult for me to be watching everything that I'm thinking and everything that I'm saying as I'm doing it. If you are, if you are, for example, there's another, another classic one that you'll even find Wikipedia articles about. It's like Japanese business culture. If you're a Japanese person in an American company trying to get a promotion in some kind of job interview process, and the way that that job interview process works, sorry, not, sorry, not job, not, um, job performance evaluation process, and the way that the job performance evaluation process works is they called you into their office in order to ask you the question, um, uh, how is your, um, they tell us about what your work is like. First of all, in, in Japanese culture, that is essentially the worst thing that could possibly happen is that your manager has called you in in order to ask you to talk about the things that you were doing. You were reporting them as they were happening, and if, and if, and if they didn't trust you to, to be reporting that correctly, they call you into their office and now it will go badly. Um, this is something where you don't want to stand up and try to take credit for the other people that are that are at the company because it was a team effort that accomplished the thing. And so unlike the boisterous American who starts talking about how they saved the day three weeks ago and the company would have completely collapsed if it hadn't been for the fact that they were on duty that day, the Japanese business person will start explaining the fact that, the, that, that it was a, a team effort that managed to do this, and they will put themselves as, as, as a support structure at best for how that team effort works. And this communication structure, this communication difference between the two parties leads to situations now where the, the person who is um, who's, who's being evaluated now is going to be given very poor marks if the person who is evaluating them doesn't understand that this is how this is that, that this is what they're used to doing. Um, you see the same situation, um, sorry, sorry, you, you see a similar situation, uh, you, you see a similar situation with job performance reviews particularly, um, uh, but not the exact same problem um, coming up uh, oftentimes in um, evaluations of women. And this is something where, you know, like when you start looking at, you know, um, things like wage gaps or things like, um, you know, specific, um, um, 
um, you know, promotions and like, like where people fall along, 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 you know, inside of hierarchies. Um, that uh, if, if you spent your entire time growing up being told to have a certain kind of, of, of attitude about something or being judged by um, a men in the culture for, for taking a more take charge attitude of, of something, um, that then uh, when it comes time to these job evaluations, it can be very difficult in order to turn all of that off and try to and, and, and be able to have this. This is a reason why it is so important that you have such diversity inside of a company in order to make certain that when you that that you um, and it's not inside of a company inside of a jury um, uh, in order to determine um, uh, how when somebody's acting a certain way what that actually means and to make certain that you don't construct a hiring process or construct a performance evaluation process or construct a uh, a jury judgment process that that is extremely biased um, against against people with with a particular kind of like. Um, uh, uh, mental um, uh, way of dealing with things. Um, actually, I'm going to skip these couple here. Because uh, actually, this is, a, this, is, this, is, this is a decide that actually is, it was I think a fun one about software, but I'm actually uh, not, I, I forgot that I, I, I ended up adding a bunch of slides at the end that I thought it made this whole thing much more, much more, much more relevant in some other way. So I, to bring back to the premise now, so you know, we're all sitting here, we're all working from home. And um, Working from home is something that I'm in a lot of meetings about, and a lot of meetings people who talk about how absolutely, and I've seen a lot of arguments about online about how just absolutely weird it is, and how frustrating it is, and how, um, uh, and, and, and the arguments about like, you know, is this a good thing for, or not? And it's interesting that there are people for whom it is a bit, clearly a bad thing the way that, certainly right now, I mean, right now it is just like when you get abruptly thrown into it and you weren't expecting it, um, I mean, you might be sitting at your kitchen table keep, um, uh, keeping track of your children who cannot, have nowhere to go because they might normally be at school right now, there might normally be some kind of daycare for them, and you're simultaneously now trying to do your job in, in this, like, on your kitchen table on your tiny laptop while um, uh, taking care of your children. And this is something that uh, clearly the way, and like, it's giving people in some sense also a bad taste in their mouth for what work at home can mean. Um, but Work from home is some um, doesn't have to, to to be like that when it's been when you've thought about it beforehand and it's something that, that kind of also is like what well, your culture of your both your company and and how you brought it into um, companies. Apple did this advertisement recently um, about um, using Mac products and how they can support people who are working from home and it was interesting because just how much it leaned into an incredibly toxic work culture of people who were just constantly on call and people who were um, being forced to um, be doing doing work in ridiculous environments that their manager knew that they were involved in but they didn't seem to even care at all. Um, and, uh, and, and that you need to have compassion for people who are particularly thrown into such an environment without any preparation, um, without any help from the company. Um, but so the, a lot of the discussions that I end up having on this, um, uh, end up occurring in like the local government context. So I'm, I'm, I'm a local politician here, um, in the little college town that I'm at. And so I end up dealing out with a lot of the, um, not, not actually from the college, but from the local, um, like elementary schools. I'm in a lot of meetings with these people. I am, a, I am the weirdo in all of these meetings for many reasons. One of which being that I am a night owl, um, you know, creature of the night sort of software developer. And it's just like, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this very strange enigma to everybody in all these meetings. Um, um. Did I not have something in the middle here? Well, I'm mean, very strange. But like, but another one aspect of it is that I've always worked from home and that I seem very comfortable with it and people find that itself very, very confusing. So the reason why I've always been very so comfortable with this is actually because of my father. So uh, this is a very low quality photo of my father that I pulled from Facebook. Uh, there are not many photos of him on Facebook and I, uh, I should be... I, 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 you're like if you're just wondering like why is it such a low quality photo of my father is because I was just like I just need to find a photo like right now I just need to put one up and I went on Facebook and like there's only like two photos if you on Facebook I'll put them both in the presentation so this is what my father looked like when he was younger um, my father worked for a company in Saudi Arabia for a long time he just lived in Saudi Arabia and my family would fly back and forth um, when uh, at, at, when I was about like eight or nine my father decided that he should really like particularly I was in school I couldn't just be you know spending all my time with you know it was like they had to be more organized right and he wanted to be around and so he arranged to work from home in the United States and he would instead spend a few months out of every year in Saudi Arabia but then he would just be at home all the time and it actually he managed to make it work in a glorious way in some sense from my perspective as a child because he was just always available except he had to have a certain amount of time that he wasn't available uh, but it didn't really matter when, because it's not like his company was ever awake at the same time that, that, that he was, uh, because they were so far away, both in time and space. 
it was the 90s, and so he was dealing with fax machines for quite a bit of it until they finally started having things like email. Um, fax machines are... are uh, I, I, I found this stock photo of somebody actually seemed to be happy fixing a printer. You're never happy fixing a printer. I just I could not even believe that that was... The, 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 they managed to convince somebody to pose in this point. But... But it kind of ended up being this like training wheels in some sense of making me feel very comfortable with the idea that work from home is what happens and that um, when I grow up, I should expect to work from home and that I should therefore have the setup for it. And so if you have a desk and a nice chair and you have um, a uh, and, and, and you consider things to be asynchronous in the sense that, oh, things are happening, but like you can judge, well, this is something that it's on fire and this is something where I'm just going to turn notifications to the entire company off for a day and just be like, no, 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 I'm just going to go hang out with this thing and that's OK. Um, it's it works. But it requires in some like I'm I, I actually haven't talked. I, I even talked to my father uh, yesterday about it and I was like asking him like how and and. He just seems to have just pulled it off pretty quickly. Um, whereas, but I pretty totally, like, it's a difficult, I mean, it's a, I mean, like, when I look at, like, the idea of, of going to an office, I, if I think about, it, like, that's easy for a lot of people. And for me, it's just, it just re it sounds ridiculously complicated. You've got to deal through uh, so much commuting, so much time lost, and, and um, the process of, of having to, uh, of getting, get ready and be presentable every single day, even though the fact that, like, you know, I'm probably going to spend the entire day today debugging things and just, and, like, going through issue tickets and, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be coordinating with people via a lot of text messaging. Why do I have to spend that much time getting ready to be presentable in front of a group of people? It's, 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 it's a consistent but very different reality. And um, okay, so one of the things my, my, my father got involved, like he was using like, things like Palm Pilots. Fun thing when you actually start setting up your life for this is that, so my father would just be able to come out in any, any outing. He became the chaperone on any event because he'd figured out to work from anywhere, not just work from home, but he just worked from anywhere. And so he was working on Palm Pilots. You could just leave him alone on a bench and then come back and pick him up an hour later. And he actually used that hour of time to take away from an hour of time that he would have to be working at some point later um, in order to allow him to have the maximum time being able to hang out with you while while you were interested in doing maximal hanging out with him. Um, and that was something that then I ended up growing up into of, of working with early tablet computers. I mean, I had a, um, both he and I had this like early prototype Dauphin DTR1 Microsoft Windows for pen computing devices. Um, I was using some of the early in the 2000s, finally, the like tablet computers. Um, I, I spent a lot of time really optimizing around how to use Nokia 6310i in order to do um, like WAP web browsing and, uh, and uh, so that I would just always feel like I was, I was productive as I was doing things. Um, and honestly, when the iPhone came out, it was a it was a it was a massive step up in some ways, but it was actually like I'd, I'd optimized my my workflow so much around my my Nokia 6310i that actually the first phone with the inability to text message multiple people at the same time, the way that the address book didn't support multiple um, different ringtones for different people, it actually it, it, you optimize your workflow sufficiently, it starts to become like a step down. Um, they fixed it in like the like couple like I, iOS three certainly was great, um, and this is related to the talk that I gave last year on kind of investing in yourself. Um, and like making certain that you understand, like, like you, you, you spend the time to make the, make the tools you're using work best for you. Um, I, I choose computers that don't have fans in them um, because sometimes you're, and this has actually happened once where I was like in a conference environment, I was typing on my laptop and suddenly my fan turns on. It sounds like a jet engine. The entire thing grinds to a halt. And everyone just looks at me like, what did you just do? And I'm like trying to get my laptop to turn off. Like I'm just trying to like do the, like the physical kill switch just because just like everyone's like, oh my, I'm like trying to cover up the fan. Like it's just like until it turns off, it was just, it was just ridiculous. Um, I have spent a lot of time looking at getting my... Um, uh, uh, build environments have oftentimes run run on on cloud machines so that I could have very very lightweight small computers that um, even though I'm 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 able to I, I want to be able to do builds quickly because I've got large projects that I'm working on that have heavy compile times um, by by switching to these like lightweight computers you will uh, you will find me wandering around and I actually do have a photo of myself doing it but I this, again I'm just using stock photos and a few things I pulled from Facebook of um, being able to like walk and type with one hand and be able to get things done um, in transit between two locations because if I can get 20 minutes of work done while walking from one place to another place that's 20 minutes of more fun I get to have when I get to wherever it is that I'm going um, uh, it does have the weirdness that um, because I can do work anywhere sometimes I will but it it it's Honestly, I didn't enjoy this environment anyway. So I had the fun of being able to wander around between the various clubs uh, and hang out with people. And then once I got there and they were doing, I put my earplugs in and be able to sit there, get something done. And then, okay, now they're done doing whatever it is that they're doing. And now I can go rejoin them for the next enjoyable part of the, the leg of the excursion. The same as my father would just be like, okay, it sounds, you, you just want to go into the toy store for a while. 
that's not really my thing. So I'm going to sit, you can have all the fun you want. I'm just going to sit here on this, this bench for a little while. Um, uh, Apple, however, has now discontinued the MacBook 12-inch computer that I've been using. So I've been frantically trying to find replacements. I've even looked into using a little foldable keyboard with an Android phone, and I managed to get my build environment running on the phone. It was uh, it wasn't quite it wasn't quite right, but I I'm, I'm working on it. Maybe maybe that will be the solution. I've looked into using I love tablet computers. Trying to use like a Chrome Pixel Book, um, but the weird thing is 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 that um, I, with lockdown and now just being inside all the time, something very strange for Jay happened, which is that now I'm actually doing this talk and have been doing most of my work on a desktop computer that I cannot move even an inch. I've got monitors surrounding me. I had particularly, I'd specifically never used uh, monitors before because I always wanted to optimize to, I can do my work on a small screen. I never feel crippled doing my work on a small screen. When I'm at home, I also do my work on a small screen. But after a, a few weeks of being surrounded by a bunch of monitors that I had purchased over the years that I had figured, well, I may as well, when I moved to my new apartment, I may as well put them in an arrangement as if I used them as a workstation. And I'm sitting there and I'm surrounded by them and I'm like, I should just, I should just use them like as a computer. Wouldn't that be like, wouldn't that? I finally started using them like that. And, and, that's, and, and the idea that I would sit around and use a desktop computer like this felt, would have felt, honestly, if you had told me I was doing this like you know, at the beginning of the year, I would have just thought that was just ridiculous. I would never do that. Of course, I would always be using small computers. I would be walking around constantly. But, but they, the, by being forced to do it, I, I've kind of learned more about some of the advantages of being able to have this much, this much CPU power is amazing. The ability for me to be simultaneously um, streaming this to, to Zoom, recompressing it, sending it to StreamYard, injecting slides with different points, having multiple monitors so that I can be seeing the different kinds of conversations that are going at the same time. That actually is powerful, and I can appreciate why people like being able to do this. Uh, and... This is also, though, in these meetings that I'm in where people are starting to get the appreciation of the power of being able to not have to commute and being able to rapidly flip back and forth between two meetings, which before they would have had to spend an hour between, um, where, uh, uh, and uh, being able to um, uh, side task a meeting where they're just available for a meeting, but they're not necessarily dedicating their time towards it. Um, it's, it's, it it's been... I think it's interesting for everybody to finally get an opportunity to see what life is like for somebody else while at the same time being, I mean, if, being horribly crippling for people who are, who are being forced in a horrible environment. I'm not trying to say that it's a, it's a positive, but I think there's like a silver lining in some sense. Um, I've spent a lot of my time trying to get meetings to be able to be like broadcast in 360 to different groups. And now it's, it's almost really easy to just throw people into meetings. I can just record them off Zoom. It's great. All right, so all of that, and uh, uh, reaching the very end of this talk, um, all of that, and then I'm like, you know, okay, so I, I've said a lot, I've said a lot, maybe, maybe some of it's maybe some of it's useful, maybe some of the thought process here are useful, particularly, I mean, I, I oftentimes do somewhat more non-technical talks that are within the scope of technical stuff, um, but I did have to ask myself, why am I not? There's something that, like, normally I, I spend more time. I, mean, I didn't last year. I, why didn't I last year? I gave a talk on improving oneself, and it was just about using technology in certain ways and thought processes. And honestly, I don't, I, I'm getting to the point where particular Apple's now discontinued my laptop. Apple's discontinued half my software by turning, you're getting rid of 32 bit and making it so I can't use Wine easily in order to be able to, like, is before I was using my laptop, I was able to run parts of my tool chain on my laptop using Wine. It's just like, no, it's not really a supported use case anymore as these switch CPU architectures for the lock on the machine. I, I mean, this is a Windows computer that I'm on. And I'm realizing that it's like, I'm just, I'm just getting more and more demoralized by just dealing with the fact that Apple even exists, much less that I'm just constantly working with the, and it's, it's not like a lot of this other, Windows is nicely open in many ways and has been for me for my talk two years ago on like, you know, you know, sometimes Microsoft gets unfairly picked on, but like, you know, but like the, the future is everything. I mean, Microsoft has learned lessons from now from Apple and is making new things. They build more locked down, like the, their whole thing where they were like, some APIs are only available if you're part of the Windows store. Um, and, you know, you look at the mobile devices and like Samsung devices are extremely locked down. And it's not that Android has market share, Samsung has market share. Uh, and so just that the, looking at the future is becoming more and more more and more painful and, and I just I guess I, I would I'd would love to I, I don't know how many people have seen the the lawsuit now that started from Epic Games 
um, billion dollar corporation versus billion dollar corporation, um, all sorts of questions about where the motives are lying. Um, you know, the, Epic is owned by Tencent, and some people are like, you know, this is just a um, a retaliation against the um, what's going on right now against WeChat and, and 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 which is which is owned by Tencent from the United States, and so it's like, okay, well maybe you know we'll we'll, we'll point out some aspect of, of hypocrisy there by funding this. I don't. Honestly, that I bring it up not just not to say just that I don't that I don't buy it. it's almost I don't even care about it. It's like if honestly if if it's the Chinese government decided that they're finally going to take on the the Apple Corporation, you know, um, uh, centralized control over all software distribution, I'm like rooting them on. <laughs> like I, yeah. Um, I, I, I've been working on a project that's trying to do, as I mentioned, if various um, previous 360 ideas, and uh, at least in passing, if not even like three years ago, kind of more and more in depth. I'm just like, of, of, of working on like decentralized systems. And also something you're seeing like the sound of like Mike Lee also has gone involved in these kind of decentralized blockchain applications. He's multiple questions during the Stump Your Experts that were kind of related to it. It's great. Um, at, but at the same time, this is just fundamentally incompatible with a world where Apple has to take 30% of everything. Um, because, well, if you can't, if you don't know what people are doing and when people are buying things, how can you take exactly 30% of it? And so Coinbase um, uh, Wallet with their decentralized application browser, they had to pull that feature. Trust Wallet has pulled that feature. Um, and uh, with, with, uh, with, with Orchid, we ended up having to build out a fiat gateway mechanism um, that allowed us to actually um, accept in-app payments in order to be able to get at, in order to be able to get our cryptocurrency so that you could then use it as part of our product. And there's just all sorts of awkwardness related to that. Um, and I just, I, I, I find, I just feel like Apple's fighting a battle that is so demoralizingly broken on the wrong side of where I think history is going that it just makes me so sad. Um, this is the last slide, and I'm trying to remember what I what I put this here. So, oh, this is this was this was this was the the 30% cut that's just going right through your head. Because um, it's not its not even about, honestly, it's not about the money in the 30%. I mean, I've, I've given, I give a talk at 360i Dev where I literally was, I think it was, I think it was 360i Dev. I certainly, I actually give a talk at Jailbreak Con where I was defending the process of how app stores take take money and the, and where those but like if you're not even using their payment processing and the users having to take over, that's where it starts getting to like, it's like, I can appreciate if you were actually the money's going through you and you have to deal with the customer support that sort of thing and various but like if the money is not going through you it's just it's just unreasonable but and, and it causes and then it's no longer just about the money it's like it's making products that are just not really possible in a world where that cut has to exist but um yeah that is switch back to here that is that is my that is my talk to the extent to which i managed to i spent a, i i I spent a lot of time figuring out how I was going to do this talk, and thank you so much for the people. Uh, I occasionally, I was looking, looking over quite a bit at, at that uh, Matt Whitlock and Le Levy and, and Tom and Kendall. So, so th thank you so much for being here, and, and the, the facial expressions have just been so useful. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. I don't know now what the process is exactly. Oh, actually, I, I lost this right. There's a tab which has StreamYard in it where I get to see Judy. There we go. And I can I'm here. Hello. 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 <laughs> Excellent, Excellent talk. talk. Always, always a fun, fun ride. ride. Watching, watching you. Pre you pre <laughs> um, um, I don't know if you wanted to, I don't know, give a last epilogue or whatever for the next few minutes. Uh, <laughs> or did you do a complete brain dump? Yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, I, there's like a, is there questions at this point? Is that what happens now? I don't know. Usually, don't know. but I don't see any questions. Okay, I, I guess I can also look over here. I don't know, is there anyone in Zoom that has a question? Oh, Tom Ortega is asking, what's Jay doing these days? Uh, so I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, on Orchid a lot of my time. Uh, so I'm, it's, it's it's this like somewhat as I as I just mentioned frustrating uh, attempt at trying to change the way that people think about software and networking in a, in a world that doesn't really want that to even happen and that sometimes you're like well is somebody just going to come along and try to make this entire process illegal and say oh, everything has to be centrally surveilled and that um, I, yeah I um, I, I 
I continue to uh, be involved in the like triennial rulemaking process which is relating to like jailbreaking exemptions and things like that, um, which are just about to start up again. And so there's been some initial meetings and I, I think I've convinced people to, to work on an Apple TV jailbreak exemption. Um, but the extent to which jailbreak exemptions were ever the thing that we needed to begin with for, for this sort of thing is, is always an interesting question as I've, I've given talks on in the past year as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's. Uh, oh, and I, and I'm I do a lot of more local politics, which I, I've also I think talked to you occasionally in the, in the past. Is um, particularly also serving a 360 intersect um, where I was talking about my, my work doing like running for third district county supervisor, which was a particularly fun adventure. Um, but so I'm in. I, I, I do things, uh, and I and and I I. I this is finally I, my lifestyle kind of relied on the idea that I was traveling constantly and walking around. And so the fact that I'm not traveling around constantly and walking around has meant that I've started gaining weight. I'm not as heavy as I've ever been, um, but I am now nearly as heavy as I've ever been, which is not, not good. Um, and uh, so, so that's the thing I'm doing is gaining weight and getting slightly less healthy. Uh, is that, is that a, is that a, that's a question. Okay, so now what we're going to, we're going to do is so I'm going to do this mode here. I'm going to grab, I'm going to pin you there. I'm then going to switch this from audio to... Uh, uh, line one in order to do re-injection. I'm then going to go back to here and, no, back to here and switch to this mode. And Max, do you have a question? Oh, you might be suddenly muted though. Uh, how do I fix that? I have to, I might have to fix it in the participants list, which has disappeared. Well, he might have to unmute. Oh, no. oh, there we go. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. But there we go. Great. I, I missed the button. Um, cool. Let me, uh, here, let me center myself. All right, cool. Um, yeah, quick question. So uh, I'm just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on the Epic Games Apple lawsuit, uh, where, you know, where you would like to see it go, and what do you think that's going to be the outcome? Yeah, so uh, I, it's interesting, like, I'm not certain what App Epic's motivations are. Like, Epic might actually be trying to make their own app store, maybe. That's, like, some people have, have suggested that that's where, that, that they're, like, ready to do that, and that, and that this is, like, they're, they're, they're um, opening to do that. And I think that would be interesting to have a large player like that, um, uh, uh, that, that like, is, has a well-known user community kind of, kind of force themselves into that market in that way. And if that actually is their motivation, I think that that really would cause them to, to really push this to the end of where it would need to go. Um, I would love to see, um, I, I would love to see there be essentially no, somebody should be able to make an alternative to the App Store that has all the same kind of functionality that the App Store does, and then users should be able to choose between the two of them. That's, that's my belief. And um, to the extent to which you want to then separately have the, the idea that, because um, uh, I think it is a separate thought process, that people should be able to, um, that, attempt to review software and provide ways of revoking software that's particularly bad, that there's bad things have happened with. I actually think you can have like federated curation lists, which is actually what we do in ORCID, um, is where we've got this idea that um, in addition, there's a way of finding um, uh, providers that you're utilizing, but then there's separately the ability to uh, decide that a particular provider is a bad provider. Um, and that those are not joined together. It's not that you are prevented from registering if you're a bad provider. It's that then people can check revocation lists, which your Apple device is doing anyway. And then you might be able to choose which revocation lists um, you would like to be able to opt into utilizing. And so you could actually use Epic Store and Apple's revocation list. Imagine a world like that. Um, but I, uh, I don't. I, 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 I personally have always felt that what Apple's doing is illegal. And so I think that um, I, I, I think Epic will, will win. And, um, uh, the more interesting one to me, and this is something that uh, um, actually I know, I know Max knows a little bit about, which is the, um, uh, the the Google that they've also sued Google. So um, and uh, over, and it's a much more tenuous argument because you can sideload, but it's but is but is the alternative that's available there just like a second class failure, like or like is it like is left there just in order to allow the technical argument that they are not the only app store, or is it something that's like a viable alternative? And I think that's interesting. Question. So I don't know if that if that that's what you were looking for, Max, um, with the having asked that question. All right. Thank you. Switch back to here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, um, so, so I think if, if anybody, anybody has any, any other, other questions, questions you can just, can just type it in Slack, Slack, and, and I'm, I'm sure Jay will be happy to answer you. Um, we're going to take, take a ten-minute ten break. break, and then.